These Merovingians are said to be a dynasty of Frankish priest kings with magical powers. The whole history of the Holy Grail is linked inextricably with the mysterious family called the Merovingians. It was a name used in the blockbuster The Matrix because of the power the name holds. Why? There are tales of mystery and magic, of wisdom and light, and last but not least of all, descent from God himself via his son, Jesus, and his supposed wife, Mary Magdalene. Some even go so far as to say that the Merovingians were descended from an ultra-ancient race of fallen angels that spawned the globe, taking wisdom and knowledge with them as Atlantis sank. The truth is that the line of Merovec was very special and worshipped the serpent. Their history is one of the most magical, mystical and murderous tales. We will discover that their very bloodline was so special to a secret and sacred order of serpent worshippers that their lives were in constant danger. That, and they held a dark secret that was twisted out of all recognition by the Christian Church. Prepare to discover the real secret of the Da Vinci Code. Today, there is one particular saviour myth that has crept into popular folklore through various best-selling books, documentaries and films. The Merovingian Dynasty. The Merovingian dynasty has been romantically depicted by both the regional writers in France and international best-selling authors such as Dan Brown and Bajent Lee and Lincoln. It all started with the leader of the Salian Franks in the 5th century AD, known as Merovec. The name was Latinized as Merovaeus and hence the line became known as Merovingian. Merovec and his son, Childeric I, were great warriors and fought bravely against the Visigoths. Following Childeric came his son Clovis I, who went on to unite most of Gaul and the Loire and defeated the Roman ruler, Seagrius, to the joy of almost everybody, or so the propaganda goes. It was Clovis I who adopted the Roman Catholic religion for his nation. Eventually, by the early 7th century, we end up with the infamous Dagobert II. He is also known as Dragobert, coming from the words dragon and Bert, which in turn comes from bara or para, which means pharaoh. So Dagobert simply means king or pharaoh of the dragons the Serpent King. Dagobert is said to have visited Ireland 
a home of serpent worship, and is also said to have married at Renly Chateau, where, incidentally, a ritual skull was found which had a hole in its forehead. Still today, Masons worship the head or skull of Dagobert, calling it Mahomet. It is kept in the convent of the Black Sisters at Mons. The cup that was formed to hold the skull was made into the shape of a chalice. Hence, we have the head of the Dragon Pharaoh in the chalice. A closer image to the original concepts of the Holy Grail is difficult to imagine. But who is Dagobert, and where did he come from? What makes him so important that his skull should be turned into a grail and then worshipped by the Masons? The year 469 AD, and the Roman Catholic Church makes a pact with Clovis I, King of the Franks, giving him the title New Constantine as a thank you for becoming Christian. This was the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire, which was hoped to last forever. It did not, and by the year 800 AD, the empire was threatened. Dagobert II was a French king from the supposed Grail Merovingian bloodline, and was the last of the Merovingian kings to hold the title of Holy Roman Emperor. These Merovingians are said to be a dynasty of Frankish priest kings with magical powers derived from their long red hair and the special birthmark between their shoulders of a red cross. Obviously, the Christians spread rumours of witchcraft and various other misdemeanours because Dagobert was seen as a threat. After several years spent away from his Frankish kingdoms, Dagobert returned from Ireland in 679, but there were problems with the mayors of the palace. Three years later, the Catholic Church plotted a conspiracy against him due to their displeasure with Dagobert's lack of allegiance to the Roman Church. While on a hunting trip, Dagobert was lanced through the eye by his own godson as part of the ploy. Now power was passed to Charles Martel, beginning the famous Carolingian dynasty. This basically ended the Merovingian bloodline and its run of power. From that day, the Merovingian kings were powerless and were officially thought to have died out with Dagobert's grandson, Childeric III.
Charles Martel's grandson, Charlemagne, was anointed Holy Roman Emperor. The Catholics had wiped out the troublesome Merovingians once and for all, or did they? Some still claim today that they are descendants of this special bloodline. However, my research has only gone to prove that this is pure propaganda, fueled by books such as the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, and the blatant lies of Pierre Plantard. Thousands of books have sprouted in the last few decades with new evidence, none of which is verifiable, and based upon legends. Merovingians, born of the sea, with kings connected etymologically with the snake, as well as ritualistically, were simply descendants of the serpent bloodline, the royal line descended from serpent priests. These priests of serpent worship can be found across the globe in India and China, in Britain and America. It is in fact the most ancient, verifiable religion on the planet and has seeped into every faith, creed and culture on every continent. One of the most striking images in Christian history is the Red Cross. Whether a strict Latin or a Templar cross, it is a memorable symbol, especially seen on a stark white background. Seen in relation to the Mark of Cain, or the Merovingian birthmark, or even the Templar Cross, they all seemingly relate in one way or another to be a symbol of the snake. Indeed, the Red Cross is an almost universal symbol of the snake, and therefore, to wear it one is branding oneself. The reason for this is quite simple. The serpent and the snake were intertwined. The snake was a symbol of the sun, and the cross a symbol of the seasons. The Rosicrucians, obviously meaning rose or red cross, were a strange esoteric secret society of alchemists and spiritualists, linked inextricably to the Masons, Templars and others in the story of the Grail. They have been greatly debated and researched. The term for the infamous Roslyn could very well be Rose Snake, where Lynn means snake, and is where we derive the word for line, Roslyn being the place of the rosy serpent line. Many places involved in the story of the Grail are associated with this terminology. Even the iron fence surrounding the chapel was adorned with a rose and a cross. The island of Rhodes could also be from the Syriac term for serpent, Rad, although the standard terminology comes from Rhoda, from the Rose Goddess. Either way, this place was once overrun with the cult of the serpent, and was once called Place of the Serpents. Many places in France have in fact been named after Rhodes. Rouen was Rodon, and Rene, as in Rennes Chateau, was Rede. all places deriving their names from the serpent worship of ancient times. In the mysteries of Ceres and Proserpine, the great secret is communicated to the initiates, Taurus Draconem Genuit et Taurum Draco, meaning, the bull has begotten a serpent, and the serpent a bull. It is a symbol of the sun in Taurus and emerges from the sea. As the Quinator, he supposedly spawned the Merovingian bloodline, with his son being called Merovac, after the sacred bull of Heliopolis, Mero. Like Jesus, Merovac was the son of the sun. It was this King Merovac, the first in the line of the Merovingian kings who was said to have been spawned by the Quinator. 
This is a giant sea monster with a bull or goat's head. The mer part of Merivé becomes obvious in that mer means sea, born of the sea. The word quinator, if broken down, resolves into tor for bull and quin for kin. He is the king bull of the sea, the sun in Taurus. This bull king goes back a very long way in history, right back to the days of Mesopotamia and the kings such as Sargon and Menes. But this goes back yet further to an association between these kings and their legendary genesis from ancient seaborne gods such as Oannes and Dagon, who were serpent gods. The sun, as a serpent, would sink beneath the horizon and become a fish. Dag means fish, and on means sun. Dagon is therefore the nighttime serpent sun otherwise known as the Black Sun in various esoteric traditions. The Black Sun is a symbol of the underworld and the unconscious. These are elements understood to be the remit of the serpent priests the shaman who would enter into trance states and access the gods. These myths are those of invading serpent worshippers or migrating snake cults coming into the land, bringing with them all the skills associated with the coming of these ancient gods such as metallurgy, architecture and medicine, not to mention a distinctive psychology. These deities are half bull, half fish or serpent figures, revealing their belief systems in their strained images, not their physical appearance. It reveals a belief system of a duality between the sun or bull and the snake. Awanes is Dagon, and this is related to the word for dragon. This god is the biblical Leviathan, the great serpent of ages past who encircles the world as the Ouroboros, the symbol of immortality and eternity. This is the same symbol which attracts the phrase, my end is my beginning, like the words placed into the mouth of Christ, I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. In fact, the Christians of later times went on to use the image of the Ouroboros as a symbol for the Alpha and Omega elements of their Christian faith. The Levites, of course, derive their name from the Leviathan, their name meaning sons of the Leviathan. Oannes is also the name of the Hindu Vishnu, who is linked with the serpent. However, there is another interpretation of equal worth for the Quinitor, as we shall see. In Greek myth, Heracles wrestled with the snake which transformed itself into a bull. Heracles tore off one of the horns, which the nymphs tossed into the river, where it turned into the cornucopia, or horn of plenty. In 
In Scotland, there are hundreds of Pictish symbols found on rocks and ancient Neolithic monuments. There are many that are in the image of the snake, and also with the snake in association with the bull, thus revealing the widespread nature of the bull and serpent association. The Quinator has the root kin, being possibly from Cain, and therefore showing the Quinator to be descended from the serpent race of Cain. Kin is also related to serpent and king. But what is the Quinator? Quin, as we can see, could be from king. Tor is obviously from Taurus the bull. Quin could also come from the Babylonian Quinig, who was the greatest amongst the children of the dragon goddess Tiamat. According to Babylonian legend, in the beginning there was neither land, gods, nor men. There were only elements known as Tiamat and Apsu. Tiamat was the female and spirit of salt water and primal chaos, and Apsu the male, the spirit of fresh water. Tiamat is depicted with scales and a serpentine body and legs, with horns on her head. The union of these two gods produced all the other gods, including the greatest among them, the Quinigo. The Quinator was a mythical sea beast said to be half bull and half fish or serpent. It is said to have sighed the Merovingian bloodline, as we have seen. The same Merovingians said by several authors to be descendants of Jesus, the sun deity, and so he is the sun or ruler in each zodiacal sign. Quinator, traced backwards through Greek and into Phoenician legend, is none other than Zeus, the very same god who impregnated his own daughter with Dionysius. But how is Zeus related to the Quinator? Well, Quinator is Dagon, the half-fish serpent linked with Oannes and Odacon, and giving us the dragon title. Elsewhere, Dagon is also known as Deonus, and Zeus was Dias. As we know, Zeus was known to have taken the form of the serpent to procreate, just as the Quinator sires a race of sacred kings. And in the Orphic legend, it was this son of Zeus, Dionysius, who was to be the fifth ruler of the world. The Phoenician legend involves him in the disappearance of the daughter of Canaan, Europa. Europa was a princess, or the daughter of a god, and was said to be very beautiful. One day, a servant told Europa that a white bull had appeared on a local beach. This tame bull allowed Europa to wrap garlands of flowers around its horn, and to climb on or for a ride. But the bull ran off with Europa into the sea. She was never seen again. Now we have an entire continent named after a missing girl stolen by a bull. All of this is beginning to sound very strange and on the face of it none of this ought to relate to the Holy Grail. But please stay with it a while as all will become clear. We must now move on into an area that at first glance would also appear unrelated, the Wandering Jew. A myth, mainly from the Middle Ages, of a Jew said to have lived in the time of Christ and to live forever. A 
Apparently, according to the Christian additions to the myth, he offended Christ on his way to the cross and was therefore cursed to walk the earth alone until the end of time. It does indicate that Christ had the power to give immortality on this earth, not just in heaven. One of the most interesting things, however, is not the later Middle Ages myths, which were attached to the character, but the origin. The Wandering Jew is literally an amalgamation of hundreds of supposedly separate characters, all immortal. However, they all originate from the source of the serpent immortality. The modern myth probably comes from a character called Malchus who strikes Jesus in John 18.20 and gets the curse of immortality. However, in Matthew 16.28 there is also the disciple who Jesus infers immortality upon. There be some standing here which shall not taste of death. Note that Jesus, however, says some. There were indeed several characters that Jesus bestowed earthly immortality upon, and not as a curse, but as a gift. There is also the one named Samari, who in the Quran is cursed with immortality by Moses, the wielder of the serpent Caduceus. not forgetting that Jesus is likened to Moses, who lifted the brazen serpent in the wilderness. There is a remarkable astro-theological reason for this. Jesus was an adept. He could fix time, because he understood the motion of the planets and the sun being a sun deity himself. Fixing the motion is symbolic immortality, for it escapes the cycles of life and death. It is in essence piercing or lancing the dragon, which is the sun passing overhead. This is fixing the sun in one position, so that life cannot come to an end. In a medieval fable, the wandering Jew is mentioned as having been turned into a serpent by an enchantress called Sibylia, who is connected with the healing serpent. This is the wandering Jew in serpentine form. The same wandering Jew who sheds his skin. Malchus was also known as Ahasverus or Butadeus, and in the myth it was as a porter that Ahasverus struck Christ and mocked him for walking slowly. Jesus told him to wait for his return, which of course never happened, and so Ahasverus lives still. Later Christian editions indicate that he repented of his sins and became a Catholic, which is obvious propaganda.
However, and what is most extraordinary, he is said to grow old in the normal way, but when he reaches the age of 100, he sheds his skin and rejuvenates to the age of 30. What can be more like the tale of the rejuvenating snake? And to the sacred age of 30, which is the age of illumination, and the same as the degrees between each and every zodiacal sign. The Wandering Jew is also likened to Cain, the father of the serpent race, whom it is said wanders the earth as an immortal, as the Lord put a mark upon him so that none would hurt him. There is also an amazing legend about the linking of Herm or Canunis, the horned god, with the Wandering Jew, in that they are one and the same. It is said that Herm told Jesus to drink water from the indent of a horse's hoof, telling Jesus therefore to subjugate himself to the old ways. From Pashupati to Pan, the horned god is seen throughout history in connection with the secret of the serpent. It is Pan who kicks open the sister of the Bacchus, revealing the serpent from within. Dionysus and Bacchus are the same and are often depicted with horns. And the Bacchanals of Thrace were said to wear the horns in imitation of their god. Even Zeus, who transformed himself into a serpent to bring Dionysus to life, was often depicted as having horns. The horns are thought to signify the solar aspect of the god the life-giving aspect. They are also symbolic of the bull, which is again a solar symbol, or the sun in Taurus. The goat is also associated in terms of animals, and horns with the serpent, as Dionysus is often manifested as a goat. Indeed, the awakening of Moses is symbolized by horns, or shining forth. This same Moses, who wields the serpent Caduceus' staff, raises the brazen serpent of healing for Yahweh in the wilderness. The horns then emerge as the enlightenment aspect of the serpent, the shining or illumination one gains from the processes known as Kundalini or other similar methods. They are the symbolic representation of what occurs inside the head. And this is the secret at the heart of the big secret societies of the globe, and has been for millennia. Heads are central to the story of the serpent cults, and there are many instances which prove this point. Hydra was the Greek water dragon, said by Alcaeus to have nine heads. Nine is the number of the sun, the immortal one. Polydorus tells us, for his second labour, Heracles was instructed to slay the Lernaean Hydra. The beast was nurtured in the marshes of Lerna, from where she could go out into the flatland to raid flocks and ruin the land. The Hydra was of enormous size, with eight mortal heads and a ninth one in the middle that was mortal. With Aeolus driving, Heracles rode a chariot to Lerna, and there, Stopping the horses, he found the hydra on a ridge beside the springs of Amiund, where she nested. By throwing flaming spears at her, he forced her to emerge, and as she did, he was able to catch hold. But she hung on to him by wrapping herself around one of his feet, and he was unable to help matters by striking her with his club. For as soon as one head was pounded off, two others would grow in its place. Then a giant crab came along to help the hydra and bit Heracles on the foot. For this, he killed the crab. 
and called on his own behalf to Aeolus for help. Aeolus made some torches by setting fire to a portion of the adjoining woods, and by using those to burn the buddings of the heads, he kept them from growing. When he had overcome this problem, Heracles lopped off the immortal head, which he burned and covered with a heavy boulder at the side of the road that runs through Lerna to Eleos. He cut up the Hydra's body and dipped his arrows in its venom. Strabo gives an even more telling tale of this usefulness of this poison, as he points out that the Anigros River of Elis emits an offensive odour for a distance of 20 stadia and makes the fish unfit to eat. This is attributed by some writers to the fact that certain of the Kentauri here washed off the poison they got from the Hydra. The bathing water from here cures leprosy, elephantiasis, and scabies. A strange effect for a poison to have, that it should, diluted in the waters of the river, have medicinal benefit. It has to be related to the equally peculiar concept that the Hydra had one immortal head. This, of course, relates to the discovery I made that our ancestors used venom and blood of the snake as a unique medicinal substance or elixir. Could this be a clue to the dilution ratio of venom to blood, an 8 to 1 ratio? There is another hint that maybe the diluted poison should be mixed with the horse. Heracles shot his poisonous arrows into Nessus. Has he died? Nessus, knowing how poisonous the arrows were, since they had been dipped in the gall of the Lernaean Hydra, drew out some of his blood and gave it to Gennara, telling her it was a love charm. If she wanted her husband not to desert her, she should have his garments smeared with his blood. This is not obviously linked with the horse at all, until we discover that Nessus was a centaur, and therefore half horse, half human. Like Chiron, the teacher of the snake god, Aesculapius. Let's just sideline a moment and look at the horse. The etymology of the horse is strangely linked with the snake, and it is an amazing trip through the mythologies of the world to discover the secret of this association. The word nag is now synonymous with the horse, but it comes from the Middle English nagge, which itself is the derivation of the word snag, snagger, or snecker, which is snake. This relates strongly back into India, where the word used for snake was naga. Here, alone in the language, we have this peculiar mixing between the snake and the horse, which has occurred over a vast period of time, and yet is still observable today. The horse, without doubt, is not only linked with the serpent, but also the sun, as we would expect. In Gaulish coins, there are representations of the serpent under or over a horse, said to be a symbol of the sun god. In fact, in the Bible, we have Jesus, the sun god, riding, or on top, of the ass or horse as he rides triumphantly into Jerusalem, to death, and then new life, the pattern of the sun each day. However, there is a remarkable scientific reason for this association. In order to produce anti-venom, non-lethal doses are injected into horses, and over a period of time the horse naturally builds up antibodies specifically designed to neutralise the venom. Eventually, the horse's blood is collected and the antibodies extracted to produce anti-venom. This amazing coincidence is not new. It has been known about for centuries and is as old as oral tradition can be. This idea of the ancient concept of the horse is also seen in the peculiar images of horseshoes seen on rock art in Australia, from before there were even horses in Australia. At Newgrange in Ireland, the horseshoe again is mixed with the spiral and images of snakes. Getting back now to the concept of the head and its association with the serpent, we find that the Greek god Pan, seen by many scholars as one of the progenitors of the horned god, 
found in so many places around the world. According to many sources, his father was Hermes, the wielder of a caduceus. Other sources have him as the oldest god of all, older even than Zeus. At Sirencester, England, this horned god is depicted with two snakes rearing up, replacing his legs in a similar fashion to images of Dagon. In Greek legend, there is Dionysus, who is equated to the other horned gods as the god of animals and hunting. The same Dionysus who elsewhere holds the chalice or elixir. There is also a female version of this horned god in Amalthea, the goat nymph goddess. She was the glorious nurse of Zeus and Pan. Zeus took one of Amalthea's horns and gave it to the nymphs. It became the horn of plenty, the precursor of the Holy Grail. Upon Zeus becoming the lord of the universe, he set Amalthea's image among the stars as Capricorn, which has a fish or serpent's tail. On frescoes in the Roman catacombs, the ancient pagans drew images of the sea goat carrying the caduceus, therefore linking the horned god with the healing and wise elements of the serpent. This image alone, as the goat of Mendes, was to move into alchemical and cabalistic circles much later on. The Wandering Jew and the Horned God, Osiris and Dionysus, are all synonymous now with infamous Green Man. The Green Man, or indeed Woman, can be seen across the world in medieval and even modern cathedrals and churches. Many will now be familiar with the chapel at Roslyn and the many hundreds of green men depicted there, peering from their foliage hideaways. However, take a trip to South Orminster or Lichfield Cathedral in England and you will find many more. In fact, there are thousands of green men and women across Europe. These depictions are ancient and have distinct pagan origins. And now that we understand our diverse pagan heritage, included the worship of the serpent and the many things that it entails, we must also understand that Christianity adopted it. The green man is the fertile god of nature, the god of life, and it is therefore only fitting that he has a consort and a female version of equal status. The fact that there are less female green deities poking out of stone trees from the church wall is simply because Christianity took on the paternal aspect of the Jewish religion. In truth, a rich, fertile and active nature simply had to have a dual nature of male and female and mirror the life of those on our plane of existence. But what are the origins and meanings behind this peculiar little character? Why green? This could be from the idea in the time of Moses that the area of the snake bite turned green. The green man or woman was therefore not necessarily green due to the foliage, but may have been due to the idea that he or she was immortal due to the healing venom of the snake. El Qadir is the Arabic name meaning green and is said by some to be linked to the infamous Sumerian character Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh in one epic tried to find the herb that brings eternal life, the elixir, but a snake steals it while he is taking a bath. Gilgamesh is also the one who cut the Chulupu tree, which is surrounded by serpents at its base. He takes the tree to Inanna, but keeps the rootstock where the snakes had been and makes the magic wand Miku and Puku, said to be progenitors of the serpent rods of Moses and Aaron. El Qadir is also equated with St George, the wandering Jew, Elijah and Moses, the one with the serpent staff. He is also known as Melchizedek, the longest lived person in the Bible. Dionysus, said to be the Greek green man, before he took on the role of wine and ecstasy. And the Druze say that El Qadir is John the Baptist, which is interesting when we consider 
that Lady Raglan and Sir James Fraser pointed out that human representations of the year king and queen, or green man and woman, were usually decapitated and then hung on a tree, as John is decapitated and Jesus is hung on a tree. This, of course, makes John and Jesus two aspects of the same thing. El Qadir is said to be immortal, as he drank or fell into the well of the water of life. He is wise as a serpent, and several Sufi orders claim descent and initiation via him. With connections to Islam, we have to ask, did the Templars have any idea about El Qadir? Was he Baphomet? El Qadir is also linked by some to Al Qaed, the Muslim star on the tail of Ursa Minor, behind the head of Draco. The colour green is something seen often in folklore, myth and legend, and strangely, it always seems to have some relationship to our tale. Guinevere, the serpent-connected queen of King Arthur, is said to have green or emerald robes. Sir Gawain, the Green Knight, Wolfram von Eschenbach's Parsifal, linked strongly to the Templar tale, has the hermit Trevrizet with a green reliquary. Even the sword used to behead John the Baptist is said to be emerald. Ancient Druids, Neophytes and the Fairies were said to wear green. And as we know, green is a distinctively fertile and vegetative colour across the world. For all these reasons, the secretive and ancient languages and symbols of alchemists, mystics and even Gnostics is said to be the green language. Now, just a quick mention of Roslyn. Although the Sinclair who built Roslyn was not a Templar, he was linked to the Templars indirectly. And Roslyn has hundreds of green men images, as well as Templar symbols, namely two brothers on a horse, the Agnes Day, the five-pointed star or pentacle, the head of Christ image or Baphomet, as well as the floriated cross and the dove in flight with the olive branch. Split up, and most of these images are purely Christian symbols or motifs stolen from other more ancient religions. However, put together in one place, with historical links to the Templars, we are left with little doubt that there must be a Templar and esoteric link But inside Roslyn, one is always overcome with the sheer scale of the vegetation. It is simply like bringing the outside in. In fact, this is almost exactly what was happening. The Garden of Eden with the Tree of Life and the Tree of Knowledge were brought to this place. It was a place of knowledge and eternal life. And there is little wonder the green man should be in residence. Also a few miles away from Roslyn is Temple, the modern day name for Ballantrodoc, the ancient headquarters of the Templars in Scotland. However, that Roslyn Templar diversion out of the way, we have to try and make sense of what we have learned. We began this tale with the stories of the Merovingians. This now infamous royal family has even found its way into the film The Matrix because of the perception that it has spawned secrets and secret societies around the world, as if protecting something. This whole mythos has in fact become one of the best money spinners in the literary and film worlds. We are fed little bits of information, most of which is an outright scandalous set of lies created to bolster theories that simply do not hold water. And all the time, we are forced away from the simple historical truths which underpin the balderdash spoken. There is no relationship between the supposed lineage of Jesus and Mary to shape-shifting reptiles. There is no lineage, except that created in the mind of man. In fact, it would be a far stretch of the historian's imagination to accept that a real Jesus Christ existed at all in the form that is constantly rammed down our throats. Jesus, as we can clearly see, 
was the culmination of a great many pagan deities, and all of them, without exception, are linked in one way or another to the worship of the wise serpent and to the power of the sun. It is therefore no stretch of the imagination to understand that the character of Jesus was in part based upon these serpent deities. Just look at the shedding of skin, whereby the snake crawls into a dark place and leaves behind its skin, and then emerges born again. The same thing happened to Christ as he died on the tree, was placed in a tomb, and once risen to new life, left behind his old skin or shroud. In Africa and elsewhere, the snake is still pinned to the tree as a votive offering or sacrifice to the health of the tribe. In some places, it is even pierced on the side. Christ was equated to the brazen serpent of Moses, and we are told to be wise as serpents. In truth, the ancient and pagan worship of the wise serpent has slithered, unseen, into our so-called modern religions. What there is in fact, as we can see from the disparate evidence presented above, is a whole host of clues laid bare before our very eyes. All we have to do is eradicate the preconceived thoughts that are in our minds. These thoughts were placed there at Sunday school, in textbooks, from the silver screen, or indeed from the now imposing internet. Imagine, if you will, a world that holds no mystery. No, this isn't the beginning of a John Lennon song. It is a serious attempt to alter our perspective. Imagine that there are no ghosts, no aliens, no Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot. Just imagine that man has evolved over a vast period of time and to a point where he suddenly or slowly became conscious of the world around him and his own place in it. It's like looking at a monkey and watching it as it looks around, picks up a few things and then something comes into its mind and it's startled. We can see in its eyes and actions that it is scared to death. It has suddenly realised it is sentient and quite separate from the world around him. He looks at the other monkeys now with an austere gaze and pities them, but he is also very different now and so takes himself away from nature and begins to use the world around him for products it can supply. Gradually, like a baby, his mind tries to work out how everything is put together and how to take them apart. He wants to know what those points of light are in the sky, what that big yellow round thing is and the white one that changes shape at night. He never spotted that before and so he analyses everything. A few thousand years pass by and the descendants of our little monkey are losing their hair because they have covered their bodies in the skin of other animals for the cold and wet times. They are using their minds, working out how to kill bigger and bigger quantities of animals for meat. Now they have more time on their hands, a concept they had no idea of before they became conscious. Time passes slowly and the mind develops. Some in the growing groups want to know more and as they question they become fearful of the dark night, the deep waters and the burning summers. Noises come from the woods that they no longer know because they have been too long away from that level of nature and so they wish to understand. The new world of the stars, sun, moon, raging waters, reflections and death all must be explained or avoided. For thousands of years these new men experiment with the natural world and discover all kinds of cures and even mind-altering drugs. Then one crippled little monkey man takes some strange looking mushroom and in his own mind he disappears into another world. A world that the new consciousness becomes aware of as the unconscious world of the imagination. 
But these concepts are not yet born. And so this other world is real, very real. And when the monkey man returns, he tells the others of his vision trip. He is so adamant in his belief that others try the process too and experience archetypal visions and also believe the process to be real. They see spirals and strange serpentine shapes that modern research has proven to be at the deepest level of our psyche. And so, when awake, they spot those shapes all around them and see the snake disappear into the other world and emerge with new life. It is a special animal, more special than all the others. Years pass and now we see large wooden buildings, circles of trees and pathways, all mirroring these other worlds. Pictures are painted on these structures and inside caves of the wonderful otherworldly visions. Men and women have been chosen to access these worlds for the rest of the growing tribe, and they become healers and guides, medicine men and priests. All around they paint and carve images of snakes and folklore erupts with tales of their ways. These new priests take a name, serpent priests and shining ones, and very soon they are even forming their own child's head into the elongated shape of the snake. This is not fanciful imagination. This is not aliens or beings from other dimensions. This is hard archaeological and historical fact. The evidence is there. We zoom forward now to the 21st century and what do we find? Modern myths of saviours and Christ men who can access other worlds, tales of green men and immortal shaman like semi-deities, and now stone buildings with beautiful depictions of myths that stretch back in time to our ancient monkey man, who sat one day and almost fell off his perch when he realised what the hell he was. We also see another myth forming. These Merovingians are said to be a dynasty of Frankish priest kings with magical powers. The Da Vinci Code is flawed because it is based upon allegory. It is flawed because it does not understand the reality behind the symbolism. And that dark, hidden reality is quite simply the millennia of multiple minds coming to an understanding of the natural world around them and their own psyche. It is a fear of death, the search for immortality and the creation of myths to alleviate the pain of no longer existing. It is the motion of the planets for travel and agriculture. It is the search for wisdom. And in all these things man has used an image of something all men see when in a trance state, the serpent. Take upon thyself the symbol of the serpent, and you become him. Take the mark of Cain, of the Merovingians, of the Templars, and the numerous others, and you become wise as the serpent. You gain immortality. You reside on the tree of knowledge and life, and all shall come to you for counsel. This is why kings and queens across the world are tied up with the symbols of the serpent. As above, so below. As in this world, so in the next. <laughs>